With the exception of some rounding errors, most of the floating point operations we've done so far have gone fairly smoothly. However, floating point operations can be quite complicated and we should analyze the kinds of special cases that can come up during these operations. Now, in general, whenever you're doing addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, you often need to check to see if either of the values is zero. Now, in the case of addition, this means you don't have to do the addition, that's nice. And in the case of multiplication, it means your answer will always be zero. So that's an easy check to do. You also need to check for positive and negative infinity. And what you do if one or both of your results have these values um, is fairly straightforward. Uh, it's an extra set of concerns to deal with. But so far, we don't have too many special cases to worry about. Another special case is not a number. Once again, all these operations are defined. Generally, doing an operation with one of the values being not a number will give you a not a number result. So that is, once again, fairly straightforward. Things get more complicated if you have a subnormal or denormalized number. Now remember, these are extra small numbers whose representation has a zero before the binary point in the significand instead of a one. So they're not normalized, they're denormalized or subnormal in their representation. So these are checks that occur at the beginning of any computation. For subtraction and addition specifically, we need to align or shift the numbers, um, or rather one of the numbers, so that we can do that kind of operation. And for all of the operations, we generally have to check afterwards for overflow, but not overflow of the significant, rather of the exponent. It's possible we could get an exponent that is too big to represent in our floating point representation. We also have to look for underflow, which would be an exponent too small to represent. And if we get results with exponents that are too big or too small, then the result may be infinity, it may be not a number, it depends on the specific circumstances. If all of this works out without any errors, we have to normalize the result, unless it already happens to be normalized, as has been the case with some of our examples. And after normalizing it, we need to round the final result because we can only store so many bits in the significant. Now this gives you a brief overview of the kind of complications that emerge when doing floating point operations. But even if all of this works out fine with no errors, so everything goes according to plan, we can still have some weird results that you need to be aware about. Let's take a look at this floating point number. It's going to be positive. And then I'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 ones and then a 0 in the biased exponent. Now remember that having all ones in the biased exponent means we're in a special case. We're dealing with infinity, for example, um, but we or not a number, but we don't want to deal with that. We want to be in a case where we have a very, very high value number, but that is still represented in the normal fashion. So we leave that as a zero. 
and then we'll put 23 ones here. So this is the largest number we can represent using a 32-bit floating point number. And it's approximately 3.4028235 times 10 to the 38. Now, let's also put this side by side with another floating point number. This one will be the smallest non-zero value we can represent. Obviously, zero is, um, sorry, the smallest positive non-zero number. So zero is obviously the smallest value, uh, but let's get a value that's not zero. So let's put all zeros in here. If we put all zeros here, then we are doing a subnormal representation. And now I'm going to put zeros here, a 1 at the end, so in the 23rd bit will be a 1. So this subnormal representation assumes there's a 0 and then a point here. So this number is going to be exactly 2 to the negative 149. The reason for that is that we have this exponent representing negative 126. And then we have a 0 and then a point, and then we've moved over 23 spots. So if we subtract 23 again, minus 126, minus, one, minus 23 is minus 149. So this is what the value is exactly. It gets represented approximately in decimal as 1.4 times 10 to the negative 45. So this is the maximum floating point value that's not infinity and the minimum positive non-zero floating point value. So what happens if we add these values? Well, I'm not going to go through all the details, but what we would basically have to do is align them first. We would have there's an implied one, then a binary point to the left of all these ones, these 23 ones. So we have, uh, and then, of course, this biased exponent corresponds to 2 raised to the 127. So what we essentially have is a lot of ones. In fact, we have 23 ones here. And then a whole bunch of zeros such that the total number of digits here is 127. And then here's the binary point. Zero after that if you want. And we want to add this to this number here. Well, this number is 0. Point, then a whole bunch of zeros here. And then eventually you get a 1. In fact, the total number of positions here is 149 because the power here is 2 to the negative 149. So if we were to add these values, we would get a whole bunch of 1s, a whole bunch of zeros, a binary point, a whole bunch of zeros, and then a 1 at the end. Of course, once we put this back into floating point form, we lose all of these lower precision bits. We can only store 
the upper 23 bits anyway. So that means if we add these two numbers together, the result is this number. I've added something to the number and it has not changed. Now you may think that this is irrelevant because this is such a small number, but the situation is actually far worse. Remember, I can only store the upper 23 bits of this number, so I don't have to have a number that's as small as this. I could have put a number here, such as 1011 in the binary point. If I add these two numbers together, I still get the original number back. I have to use up all of these zeros before I start to get a number that will actually affect this one if I add them together. So there's a wide range of numbers beneath this one that I simply cannot represent. More to the point, if I have, let's say, 2 to the 25, this would be 1 followed by 25 zeros. Let's split it up into the 23 that I can actually store in a floating point number, and then two more at the end. So this is, in binary, base 2, 2 to the 25. If I add 1 to this, I get 1, and then a bunch of zeros, and then a 0 and a 1. But once again, I cannot store these last two bits in the 23 bits available in the floating point representation. So this number is smaller than this maximum possible value. In fact, 2 to the 25 equals exactly 3, 3, 5, 5, 4, 4, 3, 2. And what I've just said here is that if I add 1 to this, I get this same number back. In fact, it's even worse, because in an actual programming language, I don't necessarily know where these cutoffs are. And it's possible in my source code to actually write down, for example, the number 33554433. Three, five, I could put that number directly into my code. However, if I save it as a floating point, single precision floating point number, it actually transforms into this number. So just because you put a number in your code doesn't mean that the computer will see it that way. And especially when we're going back and forth from binary and decimal, it's very confusing to know that this number, which has precision seemingly all the way down to the ones position in decimal, can't be represented in binary. So in general, keep in mind that we are using 32 bits to store our single precision floating point numbers. And even if you're using a double precision floating point number, you're still limited in the number of bits you have. There are only so many bits to represent these numbers. If I'm using 32 bits, then the full range of possible values I can represent is simply 2 to 32. This means that there are many gaps between numbers that are adjacent in this representation, but far removed from each other in the space of real numbers, which of course is infinite. Beware.